one word, wow. Wow, North Coast Church. Thank you so much for all of your generosity. I can't wait for you to hear the results of our Give Hope campaign where we are focusing on baby bottles and Belize. Chris Brown's gonna give you those results and his message as we continue in this series on David. And today we get to find out what takes place with David now that Saul's gone, and how does this nation of Israel start to be formed? And how does it apply to our lives today? Can't wait for you to be able to hear today's message. Well, first off, I just wanna say welcome and thanks for joining us each and every week at North Coast Church. A quick shout out to all of our friends across the country in Texas and Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Jim and Waco, Gina up in Washington, our folks in Sacramento, and so many of you around the country and right here in the San Diego area. Thank you for continuing to make North Coast Church your church home. Well, let's go ahead and get ready for today's message. We encourage you to download the message notes, get ready to write a bunch of notes. You can also fill out a prayer request. You can use our communication card or you can text it in by using the number right here on your screen. And I'll be personally responding to each and every one of those text messages. Well, we're gonna go ahead and join in in worship. Before we do, I just wanna remind you that this isn't somehow some sort of musical pause before the message. This is an opportunity for us to re- be able to reflect, give honor, praise, and adoration to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's do it.
North Coast Online, from wherever you are watching, wherever you are listening today, can I, before we jump into an amazing story we're going to get to, can I just say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we've been asking a lot of you lately, and I was going to get up and say, hey, let me tell you what you're doing with Baby Bottles and Belize, our Operation Hope that we're doing right now for young girls in crisis here locally and also globally. And then I started thinking about what you've done this last year. Can I just give you a snapshot of only the larger projects of what you've done? in just a year. It was just about a year ago I stood in front of you and said, here's one of our partner churches in Ecuador. Here's a bunch of projects they want. How many of them do you want to do? We told the pastor we may be able to do about five projects. You raised $150,000 to complete all 11 of their projects on their 10 different campuses. In just a few weeks, I'm going to be showing you a video before and after because we have a team of people that just got back from Ecuador to do the video and the pictures. Man, I can't wait to show you that. But that started about a year ago, $150,000 to Ecuador. Then we got in and we did the biggest backpack drive we have ever done. We more than doubled what we usually do in getting kids' backpacks to go to school in the fall to make sure they're walking in with brand new gear that's filled with all their school supplies. And you bless those families in tremendous way. We got into the holiday system and you raised $500,000 to give to the charities, but more importantly, families that were gonna have an incredibly bad Christmas this year. And you changed that for so many hundreds of families here in North County, $500,000. Do you know previous to this year, the greatest amount of money we've ever raised for Christmas was $192,000. Do you see what you guys did? Then we got into this and just started saying, man, the war's going on. What can we do for the Ukraine? We said we need to get buses. We need to charter buses through all of our partner organizations, our own North Coast missionaries in the Czech Republic and Poland and Ukraine and Russia. How do we get buses in with supplies and get women and children out? Do you realize that over that campaign, you raised somewhere, and we don't have the exact total yet, between $600,000 and $700,000. The reason why we don't have the exact total is because we linked you right with our partner organizations. But somewhere between six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars you poured into the effort to protect women and children in the ukraine and get supplies into the men and the people that had to stay in that country and fight for their freedoms and then on the heels of that a couple weeks later i stood in front of you and i said here's our baby bottle drive and here's belize and it's a lot, and we've asked a lot, but man, we got young girls being sex trafficked down in Belize, and a nation wants to do something about their problem, but they're impoverished, and they've asked for help. In the last two weeks right now, we are just shy of $400,000, and all the baby bottles haven't even been counted yet. Right around $400,000. We're going to open up new homes, new beds, new places, new training in Belize to be able to house these girls that are taken out of this horrific crime, be able to pour back in the worth and love into them just so they know there's a church in America that cares about you when it seemed like you were hopeless. And we're going to pour so much into our pregnancy resource centers across North County, pro-life clinics that are helping young girls with maybe the most well, to, to this date, uh, the most tragic decision of their life. Do they keep this baby or do they terminate it? And we want to be there alongside them to say, here's what our hope and prayer is. And here's what we're going to do for you the next couple of years if you choose to keep this child. North Coast, can I on behalf of every kid with a backpack of the thousands of families that got touched this Christmas, on the literally thousands of women and children that were taken out of the Ukraine for the tens of thousands of dollars of supplies that went into that country for the men that are staying there on behalf of every young girl right now seeking out a clinic in North County and for the lives we don't know yet they're going to be pulled out of this horrific horrific human trafficking situation in Belize can I just say thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I had a couple little voices in my ear several weeks ago saying, man, this church has given so much away. I don't think we can do another drive. What's gonna happen here? Can I just say, for those of you that call North Coast home, your continued tithing and giving here, not just for the buttons that, that stir your heart. We have got every month so far this year ending in the black because of your incredible generosity that says, I believe in what your causes are, but I believe in this church continuing to go after those causes. Man, I cannot jump into another message without stopping and saying thank you for making a difference, not just here in North County, but in the world beyond in amazing ways. 
And, and then on top of that, Compassion International came in this week, presented our staff with a gift, simply saying, I don't know if you know this, but every year, North Coasters give $1.4 million, $1,460,000, because North Coasters are sponsoring over 3,500 kids, most in Haiti and in Ecuador saying you're gonna get an education, you're gonna to belong to a local church, you're gonna have food, you're gonna have proper hygiene and medical care, and we're gonna walk you through this. $1.4 million a year you're giving to the most impoverished around the world. North Coast, it is an honor, an incredible privilege to be able to tell people, I'm part of them. <laughs> I'm part of them. I'll be able to tell our services live this weekend, but for those of you that watch online and you're still just as much part of this church as anyone else, whether you're here or across who knows where, can I just stop and say thank you. We're gonna keep preaching the gospel, we're gonna keep changing lives here, and we're gonna keep ma making a difference in the world simply because of your generosity. Wow, I wanted to do that in a minute and a half and you pushed a button, that was five minutes. Hey, five minutes of my message you don't have to listen to, but let me tell you, you're gonna wanna pick up now and turn to 1 Samuel chapter two. Things are starting to click. If you're just joining us in this mini series, where have you been? But man, it's a good day to join us. We are watching this, this, this tragedy at times of King Saul, the first king of Israel and David. The first king dies. David, we know he was anointed back when he was just a little shepherd kid watching his dad and his brother's flocks when he was number eight of the sons of a farmer. And the prophet showed up and anointed him, said, you'll be the king of Israel. But man, it's been 10 years of being chased, at least five to eight years before that. So somewhere 15 to 20 years before that anointing, before he ever gets the crown. And when we last left him, he's in Ziklag, the enemy territory. There seems to be a change of heart and mind in this guy. He's coming back to the Lord. And he just got news. The king is dead. His sons are dead. And the runner gave David the crown and the royal insignia. And that's where we pick up a story. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? When's this guy gonna be king? When are things gonna change for his life? And today, let me challenge you. You listen, you read, you watch with an open mind. This may be the day things change in your life, in your kingdom as well. How's that for a setup? You ready? Here we go. Second Samuel chapter two. Guys, are we good? Brandon, Zach, you awake? You following? I've bored the two guys in the room, so I hope I'm doing better with you guys at home. Here we go. Second Samuel chapter two. Now, in the course of time, I love that. By the way, anytime you get in the course of time in the Bible, you got to stop. What happens is we had David and his men in the enemy's territory. That's where their home is. A runner came in, gave him the crown, gave him the insignia and said, Saul and the sons are dead. The screen went dark. It comes back light. Same situation, but they're all wearing different clothes. And it simply says sometime later. That's what in the course of time means in the Bible. Some time later, he continued living in the enemy's territory, but some time later, this is when things decided to shift. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah, he asked. And the Lord said, go up. And David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord answered. Now, now I've said it before, but don't you wish God would talk to us today? David seems to say, hey, God, should I move? And God goes, yes. And David goes, where? And he's all Bonzel, but Southeast Bonzel. I don't want you going to the Northwest. He's like, oh, okay, I'll look for a place in Southeast Bonzel. Don't you wish God was that direct with us today? I mean, I mean don't you wish God, I pray. And he's like, yes, here's what I want and where I want and how I want it. Now, now David has the priest Abiathar with him. He's got that ephod. We talked about it four chapters ago, how you can inquire the Lord. But let me tell you, there are very, very rare occasions scattered across the entire Old Testament, some 4,000 years, where God actually tells someone what to do and where. Very unusual. Here's what I promise you. Every Old Testament crusty old dude and old woman, every one of these old patriarchs and matriarchs from the olden days would sit around and go, man, I wish God would just write me a letter. I wish he would just tell me what to do and who to be and how to act. Every single Old Testament character would trade those rare occurrences every couple centuries where God spoke to somebody to simply have the word of God and a letter that says, here's how you live your life. Here's how you govern your life. Here's what to do and what not to do. Oh, wouldn't that have been much simpler? Let's not envy the rare occurrences of God telling someone what and where when we've refused to even spend time in the word that he has clearly given us. This book is so much more than a voice of God every now and then saying, Bonzel. Here we go. So David decides it's time to move. So David 
went up there with his two wives, Ahinam of Jezreel of Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then, circle, highlight, underline, then the men of Judah came to Hebron where they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Finally, then David gets the throne. David becomes king. But if you read closely, he's only king over Judah. Well, Judah means Israel, right? No, Judah's just one of the 12 tribes. And, and he's from the tribe of Judah. So his own people take him back rather quickly and they make him king. But there's 12 tribes. He's got one twelfth of the kingdom so far. That's all he's sitting on, just his home territory. And when David was told that it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul, he sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead to say to them, the Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. May the Lord now, I just spit something in my mouth. Did you guys see that? If you didn't see that, we're gonna edit it out. May the Lord now show you kindness and faithfulness, and I too will show you the same favor because you have done this. Did some of you actually just go back and rewind that and see if you could see something fly out of mouth? Shame on you. Pay attention to the word of God. Now then, be strong and brave, for Saul, your master, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. Did some of you not go back and see that? But since I mentioned you can go back and see that, then you did go back and try to see that? Double shame. Here's where we go. I got both of their attention now in the room. I'm on fire today. So this scene is David's anointed king just over his tribe of Judah. He's told, by the way, it was the men of Jabesh Gilead that came up and took down the bodies of Saul and his sons. They did it in, in a perilous situations in the dead of night in the enemy's territory. And David sends word to him with condolences, with compassion, but he also says, now then, be strong and brave, for Saul your master is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. What is happening here? David is acting mighty kingly. I got one twelfth of the tribes. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna find the really brave guys that have already shown their courage and their compassion and their strength. And I'm gonna tell them, hey, condolences, you guys did a heck of a job. Can I remind you your king is dead, but I'm king now. Why don't you continue to be brave and strong? And we start seeing this kingdom start to be built. And before we take off into the kingdom of David and how he's gonna get the rest of the land, let me stop right there. This story on over first reading, I'm reading going, I don't, I don't know what to do with this spiritually for us. But by second or third reading, I was like, wow, look at the if then that happened here. In fact, I want you to write this down in your note sheet already. Come on, you're following at home, but you shouldn't just be listening. This is Bible study. We're not preaching to the crowds. We're not trying to make sure thousands agree with what we have to say. We're in the word of God. We're doing Bible study. Get out something to circle, highlight, and underline. Get your Bible in one hand, print out that note sheet or do it digitally in the other and get ready to go. Here's the first fill in the blanks on this. This is the road back home for David. You see, we can't walk in the promises of God until we become the people of God. Did you notice that? We can't walk in the promises of God until we become the people of God. David is still living in the enemy's territory, in the Philistine territory. He's still living in Ziklag. Some time has passed. He has the crown, he has the insignia, but he's not king of anything. Why? Because he's living in the enemy's territory. And he starts to inquire of God, do you want me back in the promised land? Do you want me back with the people of God? And God's like, duh, that's Hebrew, duh. What do you think you're doing? Well, I'm living in the enemy's territory, why? You want to know why? Because I've kind of cut myself off from everything and everybody else. I don't feel real spiritual. I don't feel like the people of God. I don't know if the people of God are going to accept me. But you know what else? I'm really tired of living in the enemy's territory because my heart and mind is changing. I really don't want to be with the enemy's camp anymore. Should I go back? And God's all, duh. Come back to the promised land. Come back to the people of God. I want you to come back. What's the use of carrying a crown around if you can't wear it? We got to come back to being the people of God if we want to walk in the promise of God. So listen, North Coast Online, Christian, let me tell you this. We always try to go, when's God going to work in my life? When do I have this peace, this joy, this contempt? And it's like, we've got to get ourselves out of the enemy's territory. I did this thing uh, last year at Hume Lake, or maybe it was two years ago, teaching up at Hume Lake. It was two years ago, Christian camp. And uh, there's like a thousand high schoolers in this big camp. We've been going up there for... Oh my goodness, I don't even know how many years right now, 23, 24 years, something like that. I've been speaking up at this Christian camp in Central California. 
And we're doing this illustration about are you God's child or not? And there's a big difference. We're not all children of God. We're all not walking the promises of God. There's a choice we make to be adopted in the family of God and to walk with him. And until then, we're not. And I decided to do this illustration where my, both my daughters were in camp and I have one daughter that I can pick out anytime, make her do anything, call her up on stage and she just lights up and beams. I have another daughter that I can't even say her name publicly in a group because she's like, Arr! but Karis is the one I can point out. So I found out where she was sitting. I kind of set this up a little ahead of time, but in the midst of my talk, I just walked off the stage and started, I said, guys, let's, let's just say, we got a thousand high schoolers here and, and I'm walking around and I picked this girl. What's your name? And she says her name and I mispronounce it on purpose because it sets it up. Kara. So Kara, and it was all Karis. And I'm like, oh, Karis. So this is Karis. Karis, come here. Karis, tonight after chapel, you're probably going to want to buy pizza or drinks or pizookies or a milkshake down at the snack shack. What if I buy that for you? And she's like, yeah. I said, all you got to do is give me a high five. And she gives me a high five and I give her 20 bucks. And everybody's like, whoa, me, me, me. I go, Karis, you're probably going to want to spend money up here the rest of the week. You may want to do the high ropes course. Maybe you're doing boating activities, paintball activities. You're going to do a lot of snacks. What if I promise I'll buy the rest of this week anything you want to do? I'll pay for it. And she's like, yeah. I go, but not, it's not a high five. You've got to give me a hug. Not a side hug, a full hug. And everybody's like, yeah. So the speaker gives this girl a full hug. And I go, now I'm going to buy everything you want. And everyone cheers. I go, Karis, you plan on coming back to camp next year? And she's like, I hope so. I still got my arm around her. I'm still in front of a thousand kids and their youth pastors. I go, well, uh, I'll pay for camp next year. I'll pay for your entire camp next year. And she's like, what do I have to do? And I said, you have to give me a kiss and I need to kiss you. Now the room changes. Of course you have high school kids going nuts, but you have youth pastors and counselors going, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, well, what's happening here? And Karis goes, yeah. So I kiss her on the cheek, and then I say, I'm going to kiss you on the other cheek, and then I kiss her on the forehead, and then I hold her, and I start kissing her forehead. Well, now the entire auditorium just flips upside down, because no one knows it's my kid. I let them sit in that angst, youth pastors wondering how they can get to a phone and call an 800 number, camp in the back going, oh my gosh, what is Chris doing? And I walk back up on stage, and I said, here's what you need to know about that girl. She's my wife's daughter. And still there's a little bit of, mm -hmm. I go, that's my baby girl. Karis is my daughter. And then everyone gets it. Oh, I tell you, it was a phenomenal illustration. It's like drinking poison out of an old rusty jug, but that jug was actually bought that day and filled with apple juice and our graphics and our facility spray painted it black and brown and made drip marks and made it look like it was an old canister. It was just to hook you and pull you in. Why? Because it makes a powerful illustration. You don't get dad's money. You don't get dad's love. Dad doesn't pay for you until, unless you're what? You're dad's kid. I told everybody, I'm not paying for your camp next year. Don't come up to me after chapel and go, hey, give me 20 bucks for a shake because I'm going to go get out of here. But I got a couple kids here at camp and I'm paying for everything. Why? They're my kids. Why does that make so much sense to us on a human level? And for some reason, we have such confusion with that on a spiritual level. David, you're still living in the enemy's territory. David, you're outside the promised land. <laughs> David, you may have a heart and mind change, but man, you are still living in the world. And, and you expect to be a prince? You expect to walk in the promises? You and I do the same thing, man. We live in our sin. We live in our foolishness. And not fully. We're not terrible people but we expect to still have our sin in our life and we wonder why this God thing isn't working for us. And God goes, man, you're living in the enemy's camp. See, David says, should I return to Israel? And the Lord says, go up. Where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord says. Can I connect the dots for you? Yes, you should be back with the people of God. Yes, you need to be back in the promised land. Where do I go? You go back to your people, David. Do you really need to inquire of this? And you know what he does? And we do. Why? Because many times I feel like I've lost my place with God. I've lost my place with the people of God. I'm worried I'm not going to be accepted with the people of God. Here's what the real situation with. Has I've gone too far? Have I done too much? Is there really hope in a second chance for me spiritually? I'm wearing a crown. I'm holding it at least, but I'm not, I'm not playing the role. You see, I wrote underneath that, our goal is not to get God to bless our plans, but to walk in his. 
Our goal is not to get God to bless our plans, but to walk in his. Look at your prayer life. I got to look at my life. So much of my prayer life, I'm trying to get God to bless my plans. God, here's what I want to do. God, here's what's going on at work. God, would you bless this? Would you bless this? I am far more concerned with God blessing my plans. How much of our prayer is, God, teach me to walk with you? Where am I out of step with you? Our prayer should be, God, where do I look more like you? How do I get rid of stuff in my life that's not of you? Because I know once I'm walking with his people, I'm in the promise of God. Once I'm walking with dad, I have all that is dad's. Our prayer has got to be more, how do I walk with you? But I don't know if your prayer life's like mine. My prayer life is far more, God, bless my plans. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to make, or this is where I want to go, or this is who I want to be with. This is what I want. God, bless my plans. And God's got to be in heaven going, how did this become about your plans? I thought you signed up to follow me. My prayer life shows, no, no, God, you follow me and you just throw blessings out in front of me wherever I step. But, but God, you're supposed to follow me. See, David makes a complete break from the enemy's camp. It says David takes his family and his men and all of them take their family. It's a complete break. We're done with Ziklag. We're not leaving a place to return. We're not leaving stuff here. Some of us are going ahead to see if it's good. We are taking everything we have from the enemy's camp and I'm firmly planning it in God's promise, in God's plan. Can I remind you, what's the enemy's camp? It's what David wanted to do. It's what David thought was best. It's how David wanted to live his life. He's done with what David wants to do, how David wants to live his life. And he's taken all that he has and he's planting it now in the promised land. Do you see this picture? This picture is amazing. You see, God isn't blessing and providing for a life in Ziklag. And that's the moral of the first seven verses. God is not gonna bless and provide for a life still living in Ziklag. That's, that's, that's the enemy's territory where David is. I want God to bless my life, my plans with the sin that's in my life. And God's like, that's not what I'm about. I'm about changing you and making you more like me so you can walk with me. Well, I don't want that. I want you to bless where I'm at. And that's where I loved. I had you circle, highlight, underline. Verse three again, David took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and, uh, and in its towns. Then, circle, highlight, underline, then the men of Judah came to Hebron, Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Once I got back to walking with God, once I left Ziklag, once I got with the people of God, then the plan of God was there. Why? Because the plan of God is not to follow me around and bless my life. The plan of God is to get me out of my life and in him. Then you're going to find out why you were anointed. Then you're going to find out why you were made. Then you're going to find out your purpose. But guess what? You're not going to find it here. You're not going to find it in Ziklag. You're not going to find it pursuing yourself. Does this not make sense to us? It's a dad that says this one. I'm providing for this one. And he high fives and he hugs and he starts kissing. And everybody's like, oh, what are you doing with that one? This one's mine. This one's mine. Man, that's my child. That's my kid. And that one has my heart and my mind and all my resources. That one has all of me. I find myself in chapter two wanting to run in the world after my own ambitions, my own self. And I'm a little upset that God's not blessing me. Man, I've got this whole thing backwards. I really think God should be following me and my plans and just throwing blesses out in front of me. And God's all, Chris, get out of Ziklag. Get over yourself. Get back with me. Then there was a second anointing. Then there was a fresh anointing. Did he need a second anointing? Yeah. Maybe it was more symbolic. But look where you've been the last 15 to 20 years, buddy. <laughs> that first anointing sure, sure seemed like it weared off. I mean, you've come a long way from a shepherd. This is the second chance. And the second chance comes once you make up your mind and your heart, your determination to come back with God. Then God goes, all right, don't just carry the crown now. You can wear the crown. I was talking about this in our sermon prep and uh, Amber Hufflandia is in there and she's like, there's an illustration and she tells us this illustration and I'm like, 
I don't even know what you're talking about. And it hit me. So much of my illustrations, especially in this, are, are so, are, are, I don't know, so masculine. I mean, we've got chapters, even Mother's Day last week. Thanks for the patience with me, people. It's a chapter of killing and armies and war. And you're like, mm, mm. you're only speaking one language here. So, so let me give you this other scene. It's right at the beginning, remember? When she comes in with that red dress and she's just beautiful and everyone's like, that's our hero. And as she's walking through the little palace and the great thing, all the people are there and the dignitaries are there and someone goes with a tray and they knock the crown off of her head. Now, some of you know this language. It's Princess Diaries 2. And Anne Hathaway has the crown knocked off of her head. And the evil dude, and I don't know his name, but the evil dude grabs that crown. Mm, be careful there, princess. Someone may be willing to steal this. And she's like, oh my gosh, I hope not. But you know the whole irony, that guy is plotting to steal the crown. I probably did a very poor illustration there. I've never seen the movie, but that's what I was told. So thank you, Hofflandia. But that's a great picture of what's about to happen next. The moment you and I start getting our footing, the moment you and I start walking with God, what happens? There seems to be opposition, doesn't there? Why is it the moment you and I start walking with God, it seems like there's something to slam us because we forgot there's two forces competing for your life and my life. And watch exactly where this goes. Meanwhile, don't you hate that there's meanwhiles in the Bible? David's coming back with the people of God, the promise of God, the plan of God. He's got a crown. Now he's only one twelfth king of Israel. He's only got the tribe of Judah, but man, things are picking up. We finally see this guy. He's not killing women and children. He's not pillaging other nations. He's back where he should be. He's got the right heart. He's got a right mind. I may be able to root for David again. Meanwhile, don't you hate the meanwhiles in your life? Things would be so great if it wasn't for meanwhile. Here's what's happening on the other tribes. Abner, son of Ner, circle Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army had taken Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Manaheim. He made him king over Gilead, Asherai, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all of Israel. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned for two years. The house of Judah, however, followed David. And the length of time David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Meanwhile, let me tell you what is going on here. Every time God starts to move, there seems to be an opposition. Oh, be careful, royal princess. Someone may try to steal that crown. Oh, you think you started walking with God. But meanwhile, let me tell you what's about to knock you on your can. Abner shows up with Ishbosheth. Who in the world? Abner, Ishbosheth, Abner, Abner. We've heard of Abner before. Okay, extra credit. He was the guy that did. That's right. When David killed Goliath with the sling and Saul looked and said, who is this young man that just knocked down the mighty giant? He turned to Abner and Abner said, as surely as I am, I'll find out for you, my Lord. And Abner's the guy that finds out who David is. See, Abner is the right hand guy of King Saul. Oh, we saw him up here again. Remember King Saul is asleep right in the midst of all of his army and David sneaks in there in the middle of the night and he takes his canteen and he takes his sword and the next day Saul gets up to go hunt for David and David's on the surrounding hillside and he yells out, hey, are you looking for this? <laughs> I got your thermos and I got your weapon. I could have killed you, but I didn't. Why are you hunting me down? And then David calls out who? Abner, Abner. Great job of protecting the king, by the way. Look who got this. And Abner's like, oh man, this is a bad spot on the resume. Abner, son of Ner, and Ner is Saul's uncle. See, his cousin to King Saul, who's just been defeated and died. But he's got a plan. See, the enemy still has roots and the enemy still has a plan. And the cousin of Saul goes, I'm gonna take the last remaining son of Saul, Ishbosheth, and I'm gonna make him king. And, and, and I can run a puppet kingdom. I can control this kid and I can run a kingdom. But Abner, you've been with this for the last 15 chapters. Abner, you know David is God's anointed. Abner, you know David rightly gets the crown. But Abner doesn't care about the will of God. He has the will of Abner. And as soon as you get a crown, someone's willing to steal it. And this is where we read the next part of this chapter. It's a fun story. I didn't know what to do with it at first, but I think it's gonna make sense. So Abner, 
son of Ner, together with the men of Ishbosheth, son of Saul, left Manaheim and they went to Gibeon. Joab, son of Zariah, and David's men went out and they met him at the pool of Gibeon. One group sat down on one side of the pool and one group on the other side. Then Abner said to Joab, let's have some of the young men get up and fight hand to hand in front of us. All right, let them do it, Joab said. So they stood up and were counted off. Twelve, circle that, men for Benjamin and Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and twelve, circle that, for David. Then each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into his opponent's side, and they fell down together. So that place in Gibeon was called Helkal Hazarum, or the, the field of the sharp sword. And the battle that day was very fierce, and Abner and the men of Israel were defeated by David's men. So here's the story. Abner takes the son of Saul and sets him up as king. Hey, we, we, we've got 11 tribes. You've got one. And Abner decides to take their army and march on Hebron. Well, Joab, and it simply says that Joab here is the son of Zeruah, and Zeruah is David's sister. So here's the family tree. King Saul has a cousin named Abner who's still fighting for their family throne with one of Saul's left boys. David's sister has three boys. They're David's nephews, but because David was number eight of the boys, these nephews are the same age or probably older. So David's got older nephews that are all pledged to fight for him. And Joab is the commander of his army. And we're gonna see him for the next 15 chapters and he's gonna have a checkered past. And Abner leads these troops of these 11 guys and they all meet at this big pool and the guys of David on the other side and they're just doing what men do. Hey, you want a piece of this? Hey, you want some? You throw a punch, see what happens. Why don't you throw a punch? Why don't you throw? I'll finish this thing. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're doing this thing back and forth. And Abner decides, I'm gonna get this thing going. Hey, instead of fighting, why don't you pick your best guys and we'll pick our best guys. All right, how many 12? And they all kind of grin because they know what's happening. There's 12 tribes of Israel. That's a significant number in the Old Testament. See, there's two forces fighting over the people of God. Do you see where we're going here? There's two forces fighting over the people of God. And Abner knows what God's will is. He knows what God's anointing is, but he's still set on doing his own thing. And he brings his forces into town. Joab takes David's men from Judah. They all meet at this creek. They all have this face off. You go, you go, and they pick 12. And these 12 guys seem to destroy each other, and then the rest of the army jumps in. Why? Because you're always waiting for 13. It's 12 on 12. Everyone's cheering. Guys are around. They're all getting yoked up. And then you know what happens. Some dude jumped in and grabbed, and they're like, 13! And then it's just all go to blow. Same thing happens in, in Major League Baseball. Pitcher throws the ball. Maybe it was out of the zone. Maybe he just didn't place it. Why not? Boom, there's a dinger hit over the wall. Next guy up, pitcher just beams a dude. Everyone on both dugouts, they get out and they put one leg over the dugout fence and they're all looking, they're all looking. They're all looking for what? 13. I know that's the wrong number in baseball. They're looking for that next guy to run out and then they all go running out. This is exactly what happened. We have 12 to 12, the men are cheering, man. Then all of a sudden some dude jumps in and they're like, oh no, you don't. And both dugouts clear. But David's men have the upper hand on this day. Now watch what happens as everyone flees. The three sons of Zeruah, again, remember that's David's sister. So these are David's three nephews, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was a fleet footed as a wild gazelle. And he chased Abner turning neither to the right or to the left as he pursued him. And Abner looked behind him and asked, is that you Asahel? It is, he answered. And Abner said to him, then turn aside to the right or to the left. Take one of the young men and strip him of his weapons. But Asahel would not stop chasing him. And again, Abner warned Asahel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? And in the midst of these 12 guys fighting, all out war breaks out. David's men are routing these guys and Abner and his men start to flee because they, they've gone too far into the territory. And Asahel, one of David's nephews, kind of an unfortunate name, but when you're chased by the Asahel, you better run. But the Bible says this dude is fleet footed. He is like a deer. He is like a gazelle on the mountain path. And Asahel is just motoring. And he's not going to the left or the right. He's going right after Abner. And Abner, the commander, older dude is running up. He's like, is that you Asahel? And he's like, yeah, it is. He's like, you should turn somewhere else. I don't want to be chased by Asahel. And Asahel just keeps gaining on him. You got those moments where you stop behind a boulder. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, you better turn back. This isn't right. Dude, if you kill me, the commander, or if I have to kill you, what's that mean for your brother who's the commander? We're about to go all out civil war if you and I get into this. 
But Asahel doesn't listen. He's got a price and a prize in front of him and he keeps running. So Asahel refused to give up in pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to that place where Asahel had fallen and died. So this pursuit keeps going and Abner now running in self-defense. He can't keep this young buck off of him. Takes the spear and does it backwards. You can see it. Asahel's just about to take this guy down. But man, the old treacherous commander just does this backward thrust right through his stomach out his back and he falls dead. And when the rest of the men are pursuing come to the spot, they stop because they realize, oh, this just went from a backyard brawl to civil war. This just changed from 12 on 12 throwing down to you've killed the king's nephew. You've killed the commander's brother. This is serious go time. And both Joab and Abishai, his brothers, pursued Abner. And as the sun was setting, they came to a hill of Ammon near Gia on the way to the wasteland of Gibeon. Then the men of Benjamin rallied behind Abner. They formed themselves into a group and they took their stand on top of the hill. And Abner cut out to Joab, must the sword devour forever? Don't you realize that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their brothers? So Abner and his guys, they get chased to a very top of the hill and now they're surrounded by Joab and Abishai and they're gunning for you because what you just did to Asahel, their brother. And Abner does this plea. You guys have got to call this off. Dude, if you pursue this, the entire nation's going to be at war. This is going to be a ginormous thing. You've got to call this off for the amount of bloodshed that's going to happen if you guys take us on this hill today. And Joab answered, as surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued the pursuit of their brothers until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet and all the men came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight anymore. All that night, Abner and his men marched through the Arabah and they crossed the Jordan, continued through the whole Bithron and came to Manaheim. That night, they didn't rest on that hill. They're like, we better take off before these guys change their mind. And that night, these guys skedaddled out of the territory until they made it back home. Then Joab returned from pursuing Abner and assembled all of his men. Besides Asahel, 19 of David's men were found missing. Here's a scoreboard at the end of the day. David lost 19 men and his nephew Asahel. But David's men killed 360 Benjamites who were with Abner. This ain't even close. 360 to 19. And by the way, this is golf. You want the low score on this one. 360 to 19. They took Asahel and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night and they arrived at Hebron by daybreak. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Here's what's going on. For the next two, three chapters, you're gonna have this civil war. I just thought of skipping this and just saying, hey, go and read three chapters on your own. It's a civil war between what's left of Saul and David, and they're all trying to fight for Israel. But right when I made up my mind to let you read three chapters on your own, and we're gonna pick up the more, you know, the more well-known stories of David, it just hit me. This is a war between two kings. But more importantly, this is two kings fighting over the people of God. This is two forces fighting for the people of God. One is anointed, one's got God's hand on it, and one, even though they know God has a plan, is trying so hard to defeat it. Man, this may be the most incredible chapter in the Bible to give you and I a picture of where we're at today. What's going on in our lives as individuals? And in fact, I just want you to write this down. We can't enjoy either kingdom when serving both. We can't enjoy either kingdom. Have you found that? When I'm in my ziklag, when I'm in my sin, and when I'm trying to be a Christian, I can't enjoy either. I can't enjoy Christianity when I got sin in my life. Why? Because it is that stinking Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit that keeps saying, you're wrong, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't be doing it. And I'm like, oh man, that Holy Spirit. I can't fully be the Christian and enjoy everything in the Christian life because the conviction of my sin. But, but, the, but the opposite's also true. I can't really enjoy sin in my life. Why? Because I know what's wrong and what I shouldn't be doing. And we're stuck in a land of two kings. And we can't enjoy either by serving two kings. 
You say, Chris, I'm losing a little bit on there's two kings in our life. We're serving two kingdoms. Let me make this New Testament. Let me make this very clear. In a second, I'm going to bring up Galatians. Just let me read the first part of Galatians 5, though. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. Paul is writing saying, brother, sister, don't you realize every day is a choice to make if I'm gonna follow God or follow my flesh. Galatians then goes on and it says it this way in verse 16. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Here's your Christian choice every day. Do I want to walk in the spirit of God or my flesh, my own self, my own desires? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Do you get this? There is a war in your life every day. There's two forces competing. In the words of Princess Diary 2, someone is trying to steal the crown. You've been given and called a prince of God or a princess of God, but why don't we feel like it? Why don't I feel like I'm in God's pleasure? I'm in God's presence because I've got ziklag in my life. My own flesh is fighting the spirit constantly. Chris wants to do what Chris wants to do. Christ wants to do what Christ wants to do. I'm missing a T so often in my life. We've got to straighten out letters. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. This is the conflict in your life. This is what's going on when you and I decide to walk with God. We make ourselves a child of God. We're adopted in the kingdom and then we put a target on us because we have an enemy that wants to rip that down and apart. So, so what's that war look like? Man, I'm really glad you asked. Look at verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Well, you and I both know when we're doing wrong and what we screw up and what's not right and what's contrary to God. But let's just give you 15 of them. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, Ooh, I'm glad none of us fit that one. Dissensions, factions, envy, our drunkenness, orgies, and the like. You know the deeds of the flesh. Here's just 15 of them. I'm acting very ungodlike. I'm not acting like a child of God when I'm in any. These are our ziklags. Out of these 15, how many can you circle? This is so important to this teaching that our life group homework is going to take a jump in this this week. This is so key to you and I understanding. This week, you're going to be circle, highlight, underline. And our life groups this week are going to talk about where are we living contrary in our ziklag to the promise in the promised land of God. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what's the opposite? Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this is the beauty. This is what the Spirit does in our life when we choose to walk with Him. It's not something I have to produce. I just have to get out of Ziklag and say, God, I'm walking with you. Now let me show what the Spirit does. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All you got to do is ask your spouse this, honey, do you like me the way I am? Or would you rather me be a person of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control? It's a no-brainer. Singles, we got to look at our life, ask the people in our life, hey, should I stay the way I am or should I be a person of of this? It's a no-brainer. And against such things, there's no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions. This is what we got to do. You got rid of Ziklag and you started walking the spirit. Chris, this is the role you now play. You daily walk in the spirit or you walk in the flesh. Here's what you do. Crucify the flesh with its passions. Christ died for your sins. Why are you still playing with them? Let him be crucified. Since we live by the spirit, Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Isn't that good? Oh, listen, North Coast, there is a war going on for us. God has a kingdom. God has an anointing. God has a plan for us. Meanwhile, there's an enemy who wants to make sure that doesn't happen. There's an enemy who seems to own so much more of the world, so much more of the tribes who's hell-bent on making sure that stops. So how do we change this? This is second chances. This is our road home. 
the road home starts with number one, a change of heart. And this is what we saw in David back in chapter 30. David realized, I gotta stop going this way. Man, I'm sorry, I repent. Every time I try something new, I end up in the same destination. I don't like what I've been doing the last 10 years. 15 years, almost 20. I don't like where I'm ending up in this right now. There's got to come a change of heart, a repentance, a brokenness. God, I am sorry. I'm done doing this my way. It's a change of heart. Sin, our ziklag, should lead us to brokenness. God, my sin is against you. And I don't know if I can ever play a role again, but do you want me back in the kingdom? And God goes, duh, Move back home with your people and my promises. Let me use you. You see, then it starts with a change of mind. A change of mind is that commitment where now we see David seeking God, desiring to follow God. I talk to a lot of guys that are just like, and especially a lot of women in North, because I want my husband to lead. I want my husband to lead our family. And a lot of men are like, I don't know how to lead my family. Guys, here's how you lead. You lead by following. Stop leading. Just follow Christ. Set your heart and mind to following Christ. If you can become a follower, I promise your family will follow that. You become a follower. Don't worry about what leader means. You become a follower of Christ. Mom, you become a follower of Christ. Don't worry about leading. Because what's gonna happen is you're gonna turn around decades later and find out your kids were led in the exact same way. David had to come back to following, not leading. He's been a leader. That bankrupted him. He had a change of heart, a brokenness, a repentance. Then there is a change of mind that said there's a commitment to leave Ziklag, a commitment to go a different way. Now I have a commitment. My heart is broken. I've sinned. My mind says, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to become a follower. I'm no longer the leader. And then it's a change of address. It's a change of address. Change of address. Is this the Bonzo thing again? Yeah, it kind of. Get out of Ziklag. Where's your sin? Leave it. God's not going to bless you and change you in the midst of your sin. Get out of Ziklag. David had shown us back in chapter 30, a change your heart, a change your mind. However, some time has passed, or as the Bible said, in the course of time, David was staying in Ziklag. Christian, we can't hold the title of prince and princess while still living in the enemy's territory. God says, change your address. Get out of your sin. Allow the spirit to crucify that sin and start a new work in you. This is a God of second chances. This is the beauty of surrender. I know surrender is always a dirty word, especially for a lot of us guys, but it all depends who you're surrendering to. 27 years ago, I surrendered to the most incredible woman I've ever met, and I said, I do, and I'll put you first. That was surrender. It could be a disastrous day, but it depends on who you're surrendering to. It was the second best choice I've ever made in my life, surrendering to Amy. This is a second chance. We've watched David. I think we can all agree he doesn't deserve the second chance. Man, has he blown this bad. So much so he doesn't even know if he's welcome back with the people of God and the promise of God. And he has to make the no-brainer question, do you even want me back? And God's all, yes, get back home. The title of prince and princess isn't just for show. It's not a crown you carry around. It's who we become. Walk in the spirit. May your ziklag, your sin, your brokenness lead you to a contrite heart and repentance. Ask forgiveness for sinning against him. May you change a mindset in God. Now I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna follow you, no longer me, whatever that means. And that means a willingness to change your address. I'm no longer staying in this situation, in this relationship, in this position. I'm no longer staying in this area my sin is. God, I'm gonna move. And I'm coming back to the promised land, the people of God so I can walk in the purpose and the promises of God. I thought it was just a civil war and I realized there's two forces fighting over the people of God. It's the way it was then, it's the way it is today. This is how we come back to grace and mercy. Circle it, Galatians 5. What's your sin? What's your flesh? What's your ziklag? How do you change your heart? Come back to repentance, that's forgiveness, brokenness. How do you change your mind? God, I'm committing today and this day, my entire family is moving out of this sin and I'm firmly planning them with you. And then God, give me your grace, your spirit, your mercy to change that address. I'm never going back. 
I'm removing this from my life and may your spirit produce in me what I could never produce in me on my own. What an incredible picture of the grace and mercy that Jesus Christ gives us by dying for us and living in us and through us. Now, well, now the choice is yours. There's a roadmap. Are you willing to crucify the flesh, the sin that's still in your life that he died for? Father, may we be people that come to the point where David is, where we lay down the sin that we are holding on to. We're expecting you to bless our life. And God, just that statement, we really think it's our plans, our life. May we be people to come back to simply following you and every day wake up and say, it's your spirit I seek. It is your ways I walk in, not mine. And then God, may you have your way with us, in us, and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, thank you so much, North Coast Church, for your generosity. You have made a huge impact in the lives of so many young women. Thanks for joining us today. Once again, if you'd like to put in a prayer request, you can use the phone number right here on your screen. But otherwise, we'll see you next week.